Amen. Good morning, Inglewood family. I wonder if just uh, what a great, great morning it's already been as we've celebrated, uh, as we've said, baptism, new members uh, joining, and then just a great time of worship through song. Uh, I wonder if I might just take an opportunity to have uh, just a, a, a privilege of prayer, if you will. Um, you know, if you've, if you've been watching the news at all or if you, know, you haven't been uh, totally uh, obligated or committed this weekend, undoubtedly you've seen uh, the, the different things that have been going on, particularly in the Middle East. And as we've watched with horror, some of what's happened over there as Israel's uh, been attacked, um, I just thought we might come together just for a few moments to, to pray for the people over there. You know, a few years ago, I had a chance to lead uh, a, a trip over there. And as I did, uh, I was marked. We, we didn't just go to the sites where it were very meaningful um, as we, we walk where the Savior walked and, and see all these things. We also went to some of the local communities there. And I remember in particular uh, standing on a playground and looking at the different equipment. And there was one uh, kind of caterpillar. It was painted like a caterpillar, but it was actually a, a cement tunnel. And I, I thought, wow, that's really curious. Uh, kind of a neat tunnel right here in the middle of the playground. And our tour guide told us, oh, actually, that all communities uh, are required to have something like that because it also serves as a bomb shelter. And it struck me, uh, particularly because of the age of our kids at the time, and I just thought, dear Lord, thank you that I don't live in a country that has to have bomb shelters on its kids' playgrounds because of the fear of at any moment there could be an attack. And we heard all kinds of different scenarios of how the, they, they live with the reality and the fear that at any moment uh, a random missile or a strategic kind of attempt uh, strike could come their way. And this weekend we've watched in horror as that's exactly what's happened. And so we want to pray for the people over there uh, who are suffering, who are going through this, this time of attack. I pray that uh, kind of God would use our safety and freedom as something we would be reminded to celebrate while at the same time it prompts us uh, to pray for them and be mindful that not only people, all people around the world have that. And then in particular uh, for the, the Jewish people there in Israel that uh, God, we know, uh, has a special place. In fact, and, and Paul tells us in Romans uh, that we're indebted to them. We have a spiritual heritage with them and that God would uh, work in their lives, giving them comfort and peace, and that ultimately uh, Jesus would be um, their, their Messiah. And uh, not just in this season, but for all eternity, they would recognize him as the promised one. So let's go to the Lord in, in, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we do come to you on behalf of the nation of Israel this morning asking God that you would intervene on their behalf, that you would uh, protect them supernaturally. God, that you would defend them and fight for them as the God of justice and those who are victims of a, a great injustice. Um, Lord, an unprovoked attack and this unjust war. God, we pray that you would uh, just be with them. Show yourself mighty and strong in battle. God, in particular, we do pray for the Jewish people, knowing God that you, uh, our spiritual history is founded in what you've done historically through that nation. And God, I pray that you would be with them during this season, even now, uh, redeeming them through the, the love of Jesus, their promised Messiah, and that their faith may turn to him and find hope in what Jesus and Jesus alone offers. May we uh, remember them in prayer this week and may we celebrate and be mindful of, be grateful for the freedoms that we have and enjoy every day in this country. And we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I've been excited, uh, you know, this morning with all the different things we've seen as a church. But one of the other reasons I'm excited is because we're starting a new series today uh, in the book of Titus. It's a short letter. It's only 46 verses total, just three short chapters. Um, and I'm excited about this series because it's going to raise for us some important uh, issues to consider uh, while also raising some questions to answer. And so I'm looking forward to walking through this over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, as you're turning there, I was kind of reminded of a story. Uh, I grew up at the beach. I've mentioned that uh, before. Uh, but several years ago, I heard a story of a young man who enjoyed building sandcastles at the beach. Now, like anybody else, I enjoy going to the beach and enjoying the various 
types of recreation, whether it's swimming in the ocean or, or whatever it may be, including building sandcastles. But when I build a sandcastle, it's with the little buckets you get at the Beachware store or the Dollar General or something like that. You pack it full of, of dirt or mud, uh, kind of an interesting blend there, and you turn it over and you kind of assemble them together in, in the form of a castle. Uh, but this young man actually was, was much more dedicated to building elaborate palaces of sand. These things were constructed with care and, and, and attention uh, to the point where they were kind of marvels to look at. They were, in fact, uh, real artwork. And this young man really loved and enjoyed doing this, but uh, in, in kind of getting all the people's attention as they walked by and seeing all these different things, he also drew the jealousy of some other young men who played frequently on the beach. And because they didn't like what he did, they didn't uh, you know, see the point in what he did, they used to find excuses as to how they they could and why they could tear it down. And so, for instance, they would throw the football, and as one person was running to catch the football, they would fall into the sandcastle and, oh, so sorry, didn't mean to, to, to tear it down. Or they would be uh, horse playing and run around playing tag and somehow fall and trip or push one another into the castle and destroy the sandcastle. Then they just got so uh, kind of obstinate about it that they just didn't come up with any more excuses. When they saw those sandcastles, they would run through uh, and they would just kick through it and just kind of explode and see how, how much they could, how fast they could destroy these sandcastles. Well, the young man who did these and built these was really discouraged by this. Day after day, this continued to happen until finally he decided one day that he was going to take a little different approach. So he got up and got to the beach early that morning. And instead of just starting to construct the foundation of sand by building a, a foundation of sand uh, for his castle, he actually started with center blocks. And as he buried those kind of under the, the foundation of the sand and built on top of those, uh, he got close to being at the end of his sandcastle. And about that time, he looked down the beach and sure enough, here came this group of young men and he knew what was coming. And as they began charging towards his sandcastle, he got up and immediately began to run the other way. And typically he would run in discouragement or fear or frustration. But this time they couldn't see it, but he's running the other way with a smile on his face. And he's celebrating, you know, his victory in essence as he listens to their screams and their cries because they were suffering the agony of defeat. Okay, yeah. They went, you, okay, yeah. So the agony, anyways, the point is this. Um, from the time Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, that on this confession, this truth, this reality, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, on this foundation, on this rock, I will build my church. From that time, there has been efforts from the enemy to attack and to tear down and to destroy God's church. It's not anything new. It's happened for all the centuries of his existence, people out to destroy the church. And in our culture today, in our society, where we're watching maybe perhaps the greatest season in American history of, of vitriol or anger uh, being directed towards hostility, directed towards the church. As we watch the, the, the immorality of our culture mushroom into this, this cloud that, that, over, that hangs over all of us, you know, and, and their hostility now directed towards godly values, Christian values, and anybody who holds them, we recognize that the enemy is targeting and trying to tear down the church. But Jesus, in declaring that he was going to build his church, also declared a promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The any, any attempt from the enemy to tear it down would not succeed because of the foundation that it was built on. It's important then for us to consider a season like this, what the church is, what it means, what is God's design and desire for the church. But even more particular and maybe more specifically close to home, as we consider what it means to be the church here at Inglewood Baptist Church, we're also walking through a season of transition. One that, that, that doesn't have in the absence of a senior pastor that, that must also consider who are we as a church? Because can I tell you something this morning? Who a church is is not defined by its pastor. And many times churches and seasons of transition will begin to, to kind of look at themselves and then begin to look for the type of pastor they want so that they could follow and, and see themselves saying, I could see us following a pastor like that, or these are the certain attributes that we want, characteristics we want to see so that we can kind of follow him. But the truth is, the church doesn't join a pastor, a pastor joins a church. You see, who we are as a church, and taking an honest look in the mirror to say, hmm, 
I, this is who God has called us to be. This is who God's leading us to be. And this is who we're one day going to become. This is who we are as Inglewood Baptist Church. Then as you discover that and discern that, you identify the pastor who best fits with you, not the pastor you best fit with. See, this is a season where we have to take that honest look in the mirror and say, who are we as the church? And it starts with a foundational understanding of what God's design and desire for the church is. Well, that's actually what the book of Titus is all about. Paul's writing to Titus, uh, his young apostolic delegate, a believer uh, who's now pastoring uh, on the island of Crete. And he leaves Titus to set in order that which remains to establish healthy churches. And as he writes to Titus, he's also writing to the churches so that they understand what's necessary, who they are and how they're constructed. And so when we look at the book of Titus, and in particular our passage this morning, we're going to hear the question asked and hear a very clear answer. What makes a church a church? You see, when you hear the word church, there's probably different connotations that come to mind. A, a, a scene of a countryside in a little white chapel, or perhaps a, a church on the corner of a building that you ride by frequently. Or maybe there's a nostalgic memory for you that you remember growing up in a church and what that was like. And that's what comes to your mind when you hear the word church. But when Jesus looked at his disciples and said, on this rock, I will build my church. They didn't have any of those frames of reference. They didn't know what he was describing. In fact, Jesus was establishing something new. Those who were called out to be his select people, a community of faith, a community of believers. And so when we hear and read in the New Testament what the church is, it's being formed. And we can revisit that to say, okay, this is a reminder of who we are as a church and who God's called us to be. So if you found your place there in Titus chapter 1, Follow along with me as we read together and hear how God answers the question, what makes a church a church? Starting in verse 1, the Bible says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, And at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, give us understanding. Lord, help us to understand what the church is, who we are as a church, and what you desire from us. Help us to understand and celebrate all that we have as a church and help us to live faithfully as your church. God, give us understanding now by your word through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you hear the word church or read it in the New Testament, there's a couple of different ways that that we come across it. For instance, one, you might see it referenced in a singular fashion, the church. And it might even, by some translations, have a capital C. And there, when we see it or hear it this way, it's describing the global church. All of God's people for all time who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, the church. But then you also see in the New Testament where sometimes it's referenced in plural. And some translations would put a little c. So, for instance, Paul was writing to the churches of Galatia. And that's describing a local church. A local church is a community of believers, a body of believers who have gathered together in a local area to live as the church, to accomplish God's mission and to ultimately fulfill his purposes. And so you understand the relationship between the two. God's global church is all believers, and a local church can't exist without the global church. Before you ever join a local church, you become a member of God's global church by trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But the the global church can't operate without the local church. The local church becomes the outposts where God's mission is being accomplished through the people in that particular area. So the global church and the local church overlap in their understanding. And all throughout Scripture you see this concept of the local church as an arm, as the feet of the global church accomplishing God's mission. And in the New Testament, there's three really metaphors, if you will, uh, that the Bible uses to tell us who the church is. Now, these aren't just kind of figurative language. It does actually tell us and give us understanding as the reality of what it means to be the church. The first one you would recognize and be familiar with is uh, how the Bible refers to the church as the body of Christ. 
So in 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12 or Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 4, it describes the church as the body of Christ. And what's that telling us about what it means to be the church? Well, it's describing the unity that we are all one body. But it's also describing the diversity. We're made up of many members. And none of the members are the same, and yet they operate as one. So unity with diversity is the body, one body, many members. Just like our bodies have toes and fingers and arms and ears and eyes and mouths, like we are the body of Christ, and we're made up of different members who are one body. But it also speaks of functionality, right? Unity with diversity operating functionally. Meaning that it uses this metaphor as the body because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the arms reaching out to the world around us. We are seeing through the eyes of Jesus. We are uh, having the heart of Jesus operating under him, Jesus, who is the head of the body that is the church. So we're the body of Christ. But the Bible also describes us as the bride of Christ. The Bible describes us as the bride of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5 or in Revelation, we see that, that Jesus is the bridegroom and we are his beloved bride. We're the ones he came to redeem, to purchase, to select, and we belong to him. We're his bride. And that communicates another aspect of our relationship and identity. If we're the bride of Christ, it speaks to the intimacy that we share. We are objects of God's covenant love that he has uh, commended to us his love and a, and a covenant bond that cannot be broken. He has sacrificed himself and given himself out of love for us that he might uh, cherish us and honor us. We are his bride. So there's the intimacy of the relationship there that's pictured, but there's also the purity of that relationship, right? That we're called to be holy and blameless, like a bride spotless without blemish. We're called to be his bride. And we know that the church is continually being refined. We're not spotless and blameless yet. None of us are perfect, and there aren't any perfect churches. But we're the bride of Christ. We belong to him. He cherishes us. He cares for us. We are his bride. But it's not just that we're the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. The Bible also describes us as the body of Christ. And the, uh, Sorry, I said that already. The building of Christ. Right, the building of Christ. So, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 2 or 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that we are living stones being built together, assembled together on the one chief cornerstone who is Jesus himself. So we're being built into this household of faith. And being built together, it describes it there in Ephesians 2, is that we're being assembled and this provides for us stability. So we're not all leaning on ourselves, we're leaning on each other. And as interlocking blocks being built together, stones being assembled, there is stability found in being the, the building of Christ. But that building also communicates God's dwelling presence. For instance, think about the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we're told that God is going to now dwell among his people and dwell within his people. So as believers, we receive the Holy Spirit, and we are the temple. Our bodies are the temple. He lives within us. But it's not just that He lives in us individually. He lives and dwells among us corporately. So we are His building in which and among which His presence dwells here on earth. So we're God's building, the building of Christ, and the body of Christ, and the bride of Christ. That's how the New Testament defines and describes the church. But what does that look like? Practically speaking, for you and me, what does that mean? How do we become part of the building body and bride? How do, how do we then live as the building body and bride? Well, that's what he describes in this introductory kind of greeting in his letter to Titus. And as he describes it there, he identifies four attributes to speak of who we are as a church and answers the question, what makes a church a church? Well, the first truth you see in this passage is that God's church is defined by our salvation through faith. God's church is defined by our salvation through faith. You, you see here in verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, he's writing for what? For the sake of the faith of God's chosen people or God's elect. And then you see it down in verse 4, kind of as the, the bookend. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith. You know, there's lots of things that bring people together in our world. 
people are gathered together because they, same, uh, they share the same uh, political convictions. And they operate on certain ideals or certain values. And so they unite together as a certain political group or political party. There's others who join together around something, um, you know, maybe common to you uh, as a sports team. And so you find people who like the same sports team or who like the same sport in general, and there's something that they share in common, and they join together, and they, they fellowship together, and they kind of uh, do life together around sports. And some of that may be kids' sports, or some of it's professional sports. Some, of them, uh, some people join together around other social factors like, uh, you know, common interests or hobbies. Some people are really devoted to serving in the community as part of civil uh, groups. Others are in, uh, involved in things like country clubs or fishing clubs or hunting clubs or knitting clubs. They're all clubs and they're joined together around some common form of interest. But friends, the church is so much more than that. The church is not an extracurricular activity formed around social interest. It's a body of believers formed around a spiritual reality. The spiritual body of Christ that's united by faith in a common Savior. It's our salvation through faith that joins us together. He's writing for the faith of God's elect, God's chosen one, God's covenant people, and the faith, the trust that they have in Him. As we look at what it means to have our faith, we, we have to describe that this isn't just kind of, oh, this is our spiritual or religious beliefs. No, no, it's, it's specific faith. It's Christian faith. It's faith in Jesus. Because our faith is what actually transforms us and changes us. In other words, we have to recognize that we are converted by faith. Faith is the, the essence and the, the building block that all, everything else is kind of formed around. It's our common faith and a common Savior, and we are converted by faith. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. But I phrase this importantly because as he describes God's elect, God's chosen people, the faith of those, he's speaking of a people that's more than just this kind of religious community. It's those who have been converted. The Bible uses this language in Ephesians 2 when it describes those who were dead in sins but made alive. Paul used it in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says that in Christ you become a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. You're no longer what you previously were. You're now something you previously were not. Jesus used this language in John chapter 3 when he said, you must be born again. So in other words, what does it mean to be converted or saved by faith? It means that you have been transformed from a dead, lost sinner to a raised again, new creation, born into God's family. It was the picture of baptism that we watched earlier. The reason why we baptize by immersion is because that's the biblical model. And why is that? It's because it's the picture of Christ being buried, dying and being buried for our sins and rising to new life. And we, when we are baptized, are associating ourselves with his death, burial and resurrection. This is the picture of salvation that we've been converted. So when you think about conversion, what does that mean? It means that you've been saved, the faith of God's elect according to or through their knowledge of the truth. You see, our faith is not just in this kind of wishful, hopeful uh, thinking. Uh, no, no, it's in the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth in the understanding of God's uh, saving uh, realities? The Bible explains it to us. It's the truth of God's holiness, that he's perfect. It's the truth of man's sinfulness, that we're not. And it's the truth of Christ's forgiveness, that we find forgiveness for our sin before a holy God through Jesus and Jesus alone. God's holiness, man's sinfulness, and Christ's forgiveness. That's the knowledge of the truth. And our faith in that truth, our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, gives us and unites us together as the church. We're converted by faith. But it's not just that we're converted by faith. Watch this. We're also conformed by faith. In other words, the Bible talks to us about being changed and transformed and being molded. So the, the change is a spiritual reality that's born in our heart and converts us. But then that conversion begins to conform us and make us more like Jesus. Peter uh, told his readers in 1 Peter 1, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world. Right? That you're not being conformed. Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 12. But instead, we're being made like Jesus. And in Romans 8, 29, it said, For those he foreknew, God predestined that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. 
Now, notice how he describes it here in this verse. In verse 1, he says, And their knowledge of the truth, which accords or corresponds with godliness. In other words, our faith changes us. It converts us. We now are a new creation. And we're being made and remade into the likeness and the image of God. And it corresponds with godliness. And that happens by faith. You see, we don't muster up the strength to do that. In fact, the Bible uh, says it very clearly in Galatians chapter 3. You foolish people, having been saved and converted by grace through faith, are you now being perfected or matured through your works? No, it's continually by faith that God reforms us and makes us more like him. So we, this faith that saves us becomes the faith we then live by. So what does that mean for you and me? Well, when it comes to membership, being a part of God's church, that we are defined by those who have been saved by faith, you recognize that your membership in God's church and the local church here at Inglewood is not based on how you live, not based on how much you give, it's not based on how often you come or how much you serve. It's not based on how long you've been here or a part of some other church. No, it's based on your salvation through faith. You've got to ask a real honest question. Am I just living a Christian life or am I an actual Christian? Have I been converted? Has God done a work in my heart and soul where I've been born again? I'm a new creation. The Bible asks us, in fact, challenges us to, to examine ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see that you are in the faith. We're united together, and God's church is defined by salvation through faith. But also, if you have trusted Christ, are you continuing to grow in godliness? Is your life corresponding with godliness? Are you making progress in holiness? Are you kind of resting in the fact that I'm saved and God's just going to bless my life however I live it? No, God wants to work in your life to make you more like his son. Because it's at that point that you become part of the church. The church matures and becomes ultimately collectively like God's son. So therefore, when we ask ourselves, are we members of God's church? It's not based on whether we've walked an aisle, filled out a card, gone through a class, it's based on our faith in Jesus. But when we've placed our faith in Jesus and been baptized, we can then be assimilated into a local church through baptism, through going through a class, through walking an aisle, and joining with a like-minded church that believes the truth of God's grace. Membership in the church, and God's church is defined by salvation through faith. But there's a second attribute. Not only is God's church defined by our salvation through faith, God's church is defined by our hope for the future. God's church is defined by our hope for the future. Look now at verse 2. He's writing for the faith of God's elect. In hope, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. He's writing for our faith in hope. This hope ought to characterize us. And when we looked at Colossians chapter 1 a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that hope that we have that according to Romans 5, 5, does not disappoint. And according to Hebrews 6, is the anchor for our soul. What this tells us is that our eternal hope is secure. Our eternal hope is secure. The, the Bible says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, and we talked about it then, that our, our eternity, our hope is in heaven. It won't spoil, perish, or fade. It's being reserved and kept in heaven for you. And because of this, he describes it as that hope of eternal life. You know what that tells you? It tells you that that hope, all of eternity is already fixed for you. It's reserved, it's kept, and you have this hope of eternal life. It is secure. But it also tells you something else. It impacts how we live today. It's the hope of eternal life, watch this, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. He just, in one verse, spanned all of eternity. Before the ages began, an eternal life which tells you that the hope that you have for eternal life spans all the way through this earthly life and this time. In other words, our eternal hope isn't just secure. Our earthly hope is certain. Our earthly hope is certain. You say, well, how do you, how do you mean that? Listen, if God can reserve heaven for you, and we know Jesus said, I'm going away to reserve and to, to keep a place for you. So when I come back, I'll receive you unto myself, and where I am, you may be with me. He secured that. Well, our earthly hope then has some certainty because this life 
is now lived in light of that. So the Bible says that we are aliens, strangers. In other words, we're foreigners. This is not our home. We have an eternal home, and we're just passing through. But that's the case. What hope does that actually offer you for your earthly circumstances? If God has that secured, would he then let this fail? If he's promised that that's secure, will he let this promise down? Because his promises are from the ages that began. So let me explain it this way. Think about from the earliest pages of Scripture. God declared a promise. Adam and Eve sinned, fell away from God, and God promised them in that moment that there would one day come a Savior who would crush the enemy's head. Though the enemy would bruise his heel, he will crush his head. And in Genesis 3.15, that's the first promise of the gospel. And that promise was then fulfilled through all the prophets, right? And so you see that, that Abraham and, and Isaac and, and Jacob and, and Moses were all steps along the way of the covenant promise that God had made. And he made that before the ages began, and God never lies. He can't lie because it would violate or contradict his character. He's holy. He's righteous. He cannot lie. Well, if he promised it then, it's going to come true. And then what do we see after the Davidic promise and all these things? Jesus actually came, and he was born, and fulfilled all these prophecies, saying he was going to come. And then with the life that he lived and the death that he died, he fulfilled all of these prophecies and all of these promises. But it's not just the prophecies. Think about the, the law of God in the Old Testament. Here are the rules, the commands to obey and to not disobey. But those things weren't just a, a rule for us. They were actually, according to the Bible, a tutor, a teacher, pointing us to something greater. Because when we see the law and we see these uh, 700 plus uh, commands that we, none of us can live up to, we recognize, I can't do that. I can't fulfill that. I need someone to live it and fulfill it for me. And Jesus came to do that, and he lived the perfect life and never sinned. So Jesus was the fulfillment of the law in so many different ways. Because then the law, also, when you broke the law, you had to be punished. And the ultimate punishment for law, breaking the law, was death. So enter the sacrificial system. So God provides for us a sacrificial system. But this was a shadow. It was all pointing to the reality that one day from ages past, God promised there would be the ultimate sacrifice who would serve as our substitute and be sacrificed for your sin and mine and pay the price and satisfy uh, the debt that was owed to God because of that sin. So the law pointed to him, the prophets pointed to him, the sacrificial system pointed to him. It was all about Jesus. So if Jesus arrives on the scene and he fulfills all of these promises, God who promised and cannot lie. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that all the promises now for you and me are yes in Christ Jesus. All of God's promises. You say, well, Jesus already fulfilled those. No, no, no. When Jesus came, all the other promises all throughout Scripture that God will keep us, He will watch over us, He will protect us, that He will provide for us, that He will care for us, that all of the promises, that he will comfort us, that he will be with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us, all of the promises are yes in Christ Jesus. So the God who promised and cannot lie and from the foundation of the world kept these promises will keep his promise to you. So if you have the promise of eternal life, what does that tell you for your earthly life? Would you really believe and would it make sense that God, you've proven yourself that you'll keep all these promises but when it comes to hardship in my life, I'm going to be the exception. No. How would that ever be? If God has made all of those promises and never failed at one, how then would he look at you and go, yeah, I'm sorry, you don't count? No. Our eternal hope provides for us an earthly hope. And if there's one thing this world needs, friends, it's hope. This, this world is drowning in despair. You, from the tidal wave of, of emotional struggles that you, you see to the, 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 the concern and the anxiety over the inflation rate to the political unrest to the social and civil disorder that we're all facing, all of those things, people are drowning in despair. But there's one thing that should mark God's people. God's church is defined by our hope for the future. And this is not some blind optimism like, oh, it'll all work out. It all, you know, it's going to just work out in the wash. No, no, this is a reality that the God who promised before the ages began 
will keep his word. He cannot lie. And his truth is for you and for me. And as God's church, our earthly hope is certain too. So whatever you're facing today, and whatever you're struggling with in your own life, claim the truth and reality that all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. Can I interject another thought here for our family of faith here at Inglewood? Knowing God's proven past faithfulness for all eternity, for all of his people, and even our specific record of God's faithfulness for his people here at Inglewood. Is there any reason to doubt that somehow our future may be in jeopardy? Do we have to despair or worry or be concerned? No, we don't have to worry in this season of transition. Our hope for the future is certain and secure. This is what marks our church. This is what marks us as God's people. So that we, like the, the Romans, when Paul prayed for them, what a beautiful prayer when he said in Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope, how he describes God there, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you can overflow with hope by power of the Holy Spirit. You see, hope in our hearts is demonstrated through the joy and peace in our lives. Joy and peace. We ought to have smiles on our faces. We ought to have uh, peace in our hearts. We have joy and peace. And that ultimately is a reflection of God's hope in our lives. It signifies us as God's people. Friends, God's church is defined by our salvation through faith and our hope for the future. Third, God's church is defined by our mission from the Father. Our mission from the Father. Look now at what he says. He says, I'm writing for the faith in hope for those who... Uh, that God promised to. Now verse 3, and at the proper time he revealed, all those promises, at the proper time he manifested or revealed, made known in his word, the written word of scripture and the living word of Jesus. God has manifested and demonstrated the reality of salvation. And through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. In other words, Paul says, this truth, this word was preached to me and it changed my life. And now the truth that changed my life, I've been entrusted with this truth by the command of God, our Savior. So the God who saves us, and notice there, our Savior, the one who saves us has now commanded us to take the gospel we, that changed us to, uh, to be entrusted with that to then change the world around us. This is our mission from the Father. And we, like Paul, like all believers, have been called to serve. We've been called to serve. I mentioned, or I, I read it at the beginning, but uh, don't skip over. The first phrase is there of verse 1. What does it say that Paul is? Paul, he identifies himself as a servant of God. That, that word literally means bond slave. I am obligated to my master. I am a servant of God. And I am an apostle. That word literally just means one who is sent out, one who is a servant. You and I are called to be that same type of servant. Jesus said when he washed the disciples' feet in John 13, as I have served you, so then you should serve one another. Jesus said that I, as the Son of Man, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And we, like our Savior, have been called to serve. But it's not just that we're a bond servant, a servant of God. We have also been commissioned to share. We've been commissioned to share the good news. The gospel that Paul said has been entrusted into me has been entrusted to you as well. And it's not through a divine suggestion. It's by the command of God our Savior. In other words, you and I don't have the option of whether or not to share our faith. We have to pray about when and how, but we don't have to pray whether or not to do it. God has commanded us. It's not a divine suggestion. We have been commissioned to share our faith. God says that, that we're, we're his um, dignitaries. We're his ambassadors. We've been commissioned. And, and we're making an appeal on behalf of God to the world around us. Be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ as our Savior. So when we look at our mission, friends, the mission doesn't stop. The mission doesn't require certain posts or positions to be filled. We're still living on mission. The church is defined by the mission from the Father. You've been entrusted. And you know this mission is actually what pulls us together because we're part of a team now that's been kind of has a, a goal to accomplish. We, we've got a victory to achieve. And Paul described it this way when he wrote to the Philippians. In chapter 1, he said, Whether I come or remain absent... I pray that I would hear that you are in one spirit, with one mind, 
striving together for the sake of the gospel. That's the mission of the Father. We've been called to carry out this mission. And this mission is what defines us as a church. We're not just a holy, set-apart uh, group of people who gather together on regular meetings just to have a holy huddle. No, no. We've been commissioned. We've been sent. And that's what defines us as a church. So we're defined by the salvation uh, we have, the salvation by faith. We're defined by our hope for the future and our mission from the Father. But fourth and finally, we're defined by our love as a family. God's church is defined by our love as a family. Look at this final verse in verse 4. He now directs it to Titus. We know that Titus, he's mentioned uh, throughout the New Testament, over 13 times in the New Testament. He was a Gentile convert. Paul led him to Christ. Paul used him as an exhibit A in the Jerusalem Council to prove that you don't have to convert to Judaism to come to Christ. So Titus was a convert, but now he's grown and been discipled by Paul, and now he's being left to kind of lead and provide leadership for the churches there. But notice what he calls him. He now begins to use familial terms. He's part of the family. To Titus, my true child. All that history of Titus tells you something. He was not Paul's biological child. He was not like his child, like, man, you're my boy, because of our, our, our association and our closeness. He was his true child. He was his spiritual reality. We are part of a genuine family. Family is not just kind of spiritual church speak. It's a reality. We're part of the family of God. And as he describes it there, he says, my true child in the common faith. We saw that earlier, our salvation by faith. Grace and peace from who? God the Father. God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. So we are part of God's family. And when we're adopted into God's family, we understand that it's by God's love. And here's the reality that we have to remember. As we begin to serve and live and operate, God's love is what unites us. We're united by God's love as His family. There's one thing that you know a family is, is, is kind of defined by, right? It's your love. And you may show it in different ways, and different families are different, but it's your love as a family. Well, God's love unites us. In fact, in 1 John 3, 1, it says, See how great a, a, a love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. It's God's love that unites us. Watch this. God's love draws us together as His people and says, You are His family. But God's love also unifies us. It unifies us. Now you say, well, what's the difference? What's the difference in being united in, by God's love and unified in God's love? Being unified is functional. In other words, it's the MO. It's our mode of operation. It's how we function together. In other words, we don't just say, well, we're family, and so I love you, but I'm not going to like it. Right? No, no. We begin to operate and function in love. So God's love unites us. We're family. But God's love also unifies us. Let's operate it. Let's act like it. Let's be about loving. So what does it look like when God says in, 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 to his people that we ought to love one another? Jesus said that you, all people will recognize that you are my people by what? Your love for one another. There's a few places in Scripture that give us specific instruction. I mentioned earlier in 1 Corinthians 12 that we're defined as the body of Christ. He also explains that in chapter 14 as well. You know what's between chapter 12 and chapter 14? 1 Corinthians 13. That was Captain Obvious, okay? But what is 1 Corinthians 13? It's the love chapter. It's the love chapter. Love is meant to define how we operate as the body of Christ. And Paul describes it in those first few verses of chapter 13. If I, if, if I can do all these things, if I could speak with the tongues of angels, if I could perform these miracles, if I could do any of these things, if I have not love, I'm but a clanging gong or just a loud cymbal. It's all useless without love. So how should we operate in love? A couple of verses this morning as we prepare to close. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says that we should bear with one another in love. Plainly speaking, that means that we should put up with one another in love. Put up with one another. But it's not always going to be that we agree with one another. We're going to have differences and preferences. But we bear with one another in love. He goes on to say in that chapter, same chapter in Ephesians 4, 15, speak the truth in love. That's not an excuse to be rude. It doesn't say, well, I don't have to, to, to kind of couch it in any kind of way. No, no, in love. You want to be honest and say what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, but speak the truth in love. The goal is not criticism or condemnation. The goal is constructive, to build you up in love. 
And can I say something just at this? Because a lot of times we use this as an excuse to speak our mind. And many times we say, I want to speak the truth in love. And that's right. And that's clearly what the scripture says. But too many times when we apply this verse, we put ourselves as the one that's doing the speaking rather than the one being spoken to. So I wonder how it would change your understanding this morning if you said, I need to receive the word of truth in love. That when somebody tells me something that I didn't necessarily want to hear or don't necessarily agree with or like, but I recognize it's true, would I be willing to actually receive that? Speaking the word in truth corresponds with us also hearing or receiving the word in truth. And we can't always put ourselves as the one who is the, has the truth, as the, the operation that we have. And when in reality, sometimes we're the ones that need to hear it. Bear with one another love, speak the truth in love. You know what the Bible also says? It says, let us, let, us, let us not love in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. In 1 John 3, 18. You know what it's saying there? It's saying, don't just talk about it, be about it. Don't just say it, show it. You would know how to show love to your family members, right? Especially your spouse or something like that. How do you show love to one another? Finding ways to express that love. The word to show love in one another, to one another, in what we do, not just in what we say. Then also in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Hear that word, keep and earnestly. Keep on loving one another earnestly. That love ought to be that which marks us as God's people. Love one another This is a season for it. It's a season where we maybe need it more than any other time. But when we come together as God's church, do we recognize that God's church is ultimately not going to be defined by our legacy? This is speaking now as the Inglewood family. We're not going to be defined by our legacy. We're not going to be defined by a ministry philosophy or even a pastor. God's church is going to be defined by our salvation through faith, our hope for the future our mission from the Father, and our love as a family. May we be defined by those things. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift that is your church. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of your church that only comes by grace through faith. And God, I pray that even now in our own hearts that you would settle the issue of faith. God, for that one who may be wrestling with it, I'm not sure. Have I been saved? Have I been changed? God, that in their hearts they would cement that this morning. Maybe they would even come forward and grab one of our hands and say, Jesus, just to to confirm for certain, God, that they know you. They've been adopted into your family. God, and as your family, may we continue to grow in that faith, becoming more and more like your son. God, forgive us when we despair with the world around us. And we don't live with hope and joy and peace. Because God, you, you cannot lie. And you keep your promises. But God, we can live with certainty that you will take care of us and that you're in control. God, I, I pray that we would be about the mission, that we wouldn't be in a season of a holding pattern or putting things on pause. God, we wouldn't hesitate to invite our neighbors, or our coworkers to church. But God, you're, you're working. You're working here now. We're seeing people being baptized and 20 plus people joining the church. God, you're, you're working in us and among us. God, help us to then be motivated for the mission, to share the good news and to continue to preach the gospel. Father, I, I pray that through all of these things, that your love would unite us and that we would be unified as we operate by that love, that that love would mark us, how we treat one another and talk to one another, cooperate together, how we get past differences as we come to agreement. All those things, God, would be demonstrations of your love. God, we thank you for loving us. I thank you, God, for Inglewood Baptist Church, the gift it is, the way you have worked, are working, and will work in and through your people as we are your church. We love you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.